like to call the meeting to order for the district of Chatwin at uh, 4.31. I'd like the opening statement read, please. As we gather today on the traditional territory of the Treaty 8 Nations to conduct the business of the district of Chetwin, we do so knowing that we are privileged to serve the citizens of this community. We shall endeavor to conduct our business in their best interest. Thank you. Thank you. Prior to this meeting is being recorded. Prior to adoption of the agenda, I have a late item. Uh, engineer from Engineering and Public Works, Wabi Crescent SE Sanitary Upgrade Sidewalk Addition. So that it would be RA6. Any other new business to add to our agenda prior to adoption? Staff? Any uh, new items? Yeah, I just have one from the Canadian <coughs> Cancer Society for just yep. a presentation after. Okay, did you get that? Okay, thank you. I also have one. <laughs> Go ahead, Councillor Ward. Was that Councillor Wark? Yes, I also have one. I'd like to add the air quality, please. Okay, air quality, RA7. And Councilor Wark will speak to that. Any other items? Not seeing any? Adoption of the agenda. Second. Councilor Weisgruber seconds. Councilor Weisgruber seconds. All those in favor? <coughs> Any opposed? Carried. Minutes from the regular meeting. Minutes from the regular meeting held on September 6, 2022. Any so omissions? Moved. Second. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Minutes of the tax sale held on September 26, 2022. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. We have a delegation. Glenna Arnden, is she on? Oh, hey Glenna, I was going, I was like, is she on Zoom? <laughs> okay, from STARS Foundation. Oh, sorry. Make as much noise as you want. Okay, thank you. <laughs> so I'm so pleased to see all of you again. And in person, this is like the best things ever. So I'm very pleased to bring you uh, your annual update and as well, like lots of great new, exciting information about STARS. So we'll get started. So just give me one moment here. to have IT assistance. <laughs> yes. So first and foremost, you know, we want to thank you for your continued support. We are celebrating over 15 years of partnering with STARS and having this base in, out of Grand Prairie to serve northern residents. No matter which side of the fence you're on, we are northern residents together and we have been working towards enhancing a robust health and safety network for all. So you are a very 
big part of the reason why STARS is able to provide critical care anywhere. So first and foremost, you know, COVID-19, like it's taken its toll over the last couple of years, it still is out there. And so we continue to remain under strict protocol in order to protect our operations. We've taken a very slow approach to reintegration of our support staff in the bases. And we continue to see an increase in stress-related types of missions like heart attack, stroke, drug overdose. And previously, in the height of COVID, one in five STARS missions, or approximately 18 to 20 percent of our mission rate, was COVID-related. Now we are starting to see some decreased hospitalizations and decreased intubation, so decreased in the severity of COVID overall. Our transport physicians continue to assist, like your local health care providers, physicians, and nurses with critical care guidance, virtual consultation, airway management, ventilation, and resuscitation procedures. Now, our 24-7 safety network is located in Calgary, the Emergency Link Center. They have access to every available resource, so including GIS mapping, as well as preset coordinates to help locate a patient. It is our transport physicians who provide medical guidance on all critical calls. So regardless of how a patient may be transported, by ground ambulance, by fixed wing, by STARS helicopters, or another helicopter provider. If it's of critical nature, then our transport physicians provide all the medical guidance for the critical care. They help to determine the mechanism of injury and illness and, and to determine and dispatch the appropriate level of response. So now with your help in previous years, we are now having quarterly meetings with Kamloops Dispatch Center. So their directors, as well as their lead physicians, we are in consultation together on quarterly meetings. And this has really helped to advance our, uh, our efforts in order to be able to answer calls throughout Northeastern BC. There is approximately a one to 10 ratio for STARS assistance. So in other words, let's say that on an annual average, Chet one was to see 10 calls per year. This also means that through the um, dispatch center and through the guidance of the transport physicians, we've assisted your area with probably 100 calls during that year. Even if STARS did not fly the patient, we have this access now to be able to provide that um, virtual consultation and assist your first responders as well as your local hospital and your physicians with consultation in critical care. So last year, we were averaging 99 emergency requests every day coming into the Emergency Link Center. Over 36,000 emergency requests were received last year. So now, because of this and trying to advance how we can assist communities, especially, you know, if we do not respond or if we may be on another mission, we still have our transport physicians who can still ex um, provide guidance for your local responders and your physicians and nurses. So now our transport physicians are now taking a shift in the emergency link center. It's proving to be extremely effective. They are on the back end coordinating the complex logistical arrangements with the receiving hospitals for such things as scheduling a neurosurgeon or mobilizing a specialty team or scheduling the cardiac cath lab or cath scanner, which would be mandatory for stroke patient. So in that fact, now with the physicians in virtual consultation, they are making face-to-face -face decisions with your physicians as well as with the real-time diagnostics that we have in the new helicopters now, we can transmit real-time test results while we're en route to the hospital. So the physicians can make positive results. They can expedite the treatment plan on the receiving end. Uh, the result is that critical and trauma patients now, as upon arrival, can go directly into the operating room it is a game changer. We're seeing extreme improved patient outcomes. STARS is fueled by generosity. As far as government funding, we still are maintaining at 20% Alberta Health Services government funding, 80% fundraising. 
Now, earlier this year, Alberta Health Services did say that they were looking to advance to 50% government funding, which would align them with what we already received from Saskatchewan government for their two bases and Manitoba government for the base in, out of Winnipeg. So we are still hopeful. We're in very high level discussions right now as we speak to see when we might be able to hopefully have the 50% funding. It certainly does not mean that we do not continue to need our municipalities to support. You know, we've suffered a lot of things through um, the calendar campaign, not, not being able to have a presence in rural communities. Two years that we couldn't have any events because nobody could be in the same room together. We're trying to kind of bring that back now, but certainly still means that we need all of our municipal supporters as well. So with that in mind, on the aviation side, on the um, expenditure side, I mean, excuse me, you can see that more than three quarters of the pie represents aviation and medical expenditures. The Emergency Leak Center is a very small piece of 6% expenditures per year to operate that. And base operations for three bases in Alberta, Grand Prairie, Edmonton, and Calgary, as well as administration costs, we are at 12% again for the third year in a row. CRA allows up to 35%. So we very much feel that we are doing our due diligence in this area. Let's have a look at, this is a five year overview plus everything this year up to September 26th of this year. So for Chetwin itself, you can see, oh, how do I move myself here? You can't see that. Can I move that? Okay, there we go. So certainly interfacility transfers are a big part because the majority of interfacility transfers are originate from a scene call where your local ground ambulance has taken that patient to the hospital and now stars as called because it is of critical care nature as well as on scene calls so we've had four on scene calls five critical transfers from your hospital overall throughout the peace river regional district you're averaging about 12 missions per year and you can see over the last well this year and the last three years We've been over that each year. So significantly uh, last year, 2020, I think that there was a lot of assistance as well in Dawson Creek for seeing calls that have been taken by ground ambulance and could also be maybe a couple of uh, COVID related types of missions as well. So when we move forward then, this is something I'm very excited to show you. I'm not sure if this placement is good. I think it will work so this has been in the making for like 10 years taking patient postal code it does not interfere with any kind of FOIP regulations you know not any patient information just where the patient lived so taking that into account now we can see for district of Chetwin I'm trying to move this sorry for district of Chetwin there's been a total of nine residents by patient postal code since 2010. And you can see the areas now where they have been flown. So when you look on the right hand side, these are the locations where Chetwin, District of Chetwin residents traveled and needed stars. So you can see over in uh, St. Paul, one resident was flown as well as into Hudson's Hope and locally in the Chetwind area. So this is also though, you know, we have some municipalities that it shows that their residents have traveled all across Western Canada from Winnipeg and Manitoba, all the way to Eastern BC and even Southern BC, showing that this is the bigger picture of our partnership, is the fact that your residents have access to STARS across Western Canada, wherever they may travel. That is our partnership to ensure that we all have a robust health and safety network available to us. Municipal support is a significant part of support for STARS services. Like yourselves, municipalities recognize STARS as an essential service and as an emergency protective services asset for their residents. So 
So currently across Alberta, we have 90% of municipalities have joined. We are now starting to begin work with urban municipalities as well, towns and villages. Uh, city of Grand Prairie is the first city to join. We're continuing to move this forward now that we have more uh, detailed information from the postal code aspect to really show them how their, you know, their residents are being benefited by STAR services. So everyone is based on either a per capita or an annual fixed rate, which is the same for uh, Peace River Regional District. I think it's been since like 2012. You've been supporting us since the beginning of STARS Grand Prairie, so 2006. But I think since about 2010 or 12, you've been at a $170,000 per year collectively throughout the Peace River Regional District. And that really is significant support for us on an annual basis for our base. When, you know, overall they say on an average for three bases in Alberta, we're looking at approximately $10 million per base. So it's, um, it's a significant part that we have this partnership. So we currently have seven municipal leaders, including Peace River Regional District. You are one of the very first to reach logo status having reached more than $1 million in service, and we continue to applaud you for that. We also have two more upcoming municipalities in the central part of Alberta that is going to join logo status as well. So again, currently generating just over $2 million in sustainable support each year just from our municipalities. And of course, we have a brand new fleet now. We're super excited. We are now serving your residents with this brand new H145. All levels of government, federal, provincial, as well as municipal government, all supported in some part of providing so that we could reach the $138 million fleet campaign in less than five years. So we currently have nine of these H145s um, in the fleet. What you may not know is during the um, COVID years, with such significant increase in call volume, it was decided that we should take advantage of the current contract we had with Airbus, H, uh, Airbus helicopters, and so we purchased a 10th helicopter, which is coming at the end of this month. So we will have 10 in total in the entire fleet to serve Western Canada from the six bases. We are still in the process of selling the previous fleet, so of course that depends on market value and the rate of the U.S. dollar, but the exciting um, news is that since May 25th, when Grand Prairie had a welcoming event to, to unveil the new helicopter for the northern region, your residents have been being served by the new helicopter now since May. It's breakthrough technology. It outperforms the previous BK-117 in speed, range, and fuel efficiency. It's same twin, powerful twin engines as the previous model, but as you can see when in the cockpit, it's advanced avionics. It's like um, miles ahead of what we previously had. Autopilot, auto hover will help reduce pilot fatigue, especially in back-to-back -back missions superior safety features. It had the enclosed um, tail that you, you might have seen in the previous slide. So no more exposed tail rotor. It has the enclosed tail. We are all switching to a new five bladed system, which is going to be extremely beneficial in your area where it's mountainous terrain, a lot of high winds, those types of things. It will provide increased lift and load capacity with this new five bladed system as well as beneficial in complex terrain. And of course, it even has less maintenance requirements. So that is going to evolve to increase availability of the helicopter and reduce cost. And this is the highest level of critical care environment with the intensive care unit environment in the back. When you add our world-class expertise of our crew, the ICU flight nurse and the advanced life support paramedic, along with the transport physicians working behind the scenes in the emergency link center now, we, this is equipped with cutting edge diagnostics, as I explained. It has Bluetooth capability, integrated Wi-Fi, satellite connectivity. That allows us to use these cutting edge diagnostic tools like 
um, handheld ultrasound, for example, you know, which would be helpful to detect collapsed lungs, internal bleeding, heart abnormalities, all a, a, a range of all kinds of things, and the test results can be transmitted while we're in the air to the receiving doctors at the hospital so they can make those treatment plans. So it is the picture of critical care anywhere, bringing that intensive care unit environment right to wherever the patient may need it. So in closing, I just want to say we want to thank you very much for continuing to support us. STARS was born out of necessity, and now we've been flying more than 50,000 missions since 1985 inception. We thank you, District of Chetwin. We celebrate over 15 years in partnership, along with the Peace River Regional District, who has provided collectively provided support for us. So our request is I'm going to be making a presentation to the Peace River Regional District Board on October 13th and I will be formally asking them to renew, because it has expired this year, to renew their three-year commitment of support at the same $170,000 per year for a three-year pledge, and we would really appreciate your support of that as we move forward. A life is saved every day, and it's partnership that has made it possible. You have made it possible. Thank you. Thank you. Questions, counselors? Go ahead. Um, can you hear me now? Yeah. Um, the first question is, are you guys having any problems recruiting as the rest of the world is? Are you finding any problems with that? Well, certainly it, it means that it's a little more limited. I'd like to say that we, we have the advantage of a lot of critical care uh, personnel that strive and want to be a part of STARS. We've had some that have upgraded and done all kinds of things, taken extra courses in intensive care and all of this over years before they reapplied to STARS in order to kind of tick all the boxes. So. We have um, more recently, like we're very fortunate, we have people stay, like we're just now losing 30 year veterans because they're retiring, right? But for the most part, people stay. They, they love the mission, they love what we stand for. Um, from a, from a um, pilot aspect, we have a lot of ex-military pilots who have the a number of hours that's required. They also have the night vision goggle capability, but they're looking for a set schedule where they can have a family life now, and we can provide that to them. In addition to um, air medical crew, they're looking for more that they want that high level, being able to utilize the skills that they have finally achieved, you know, through working five years or more in intensive care. And um, same for the paramedics, right? We always fly with the critical care nurse and the advanced life support paramedic. That combination is a winning combination because the paramedics are like the, the ditch doctors. They know exactly what to do when you have no resources available, but now we have this intensive care unit environment. They are experts in the field of airway management, where the nurses are more on the side of the running all of the different um, pain management drugs and things that may be required, you know, so it's a wonderful combination. And then on the radios, we have access to the critical care transport physicians. So it's and when you have the time, you have tools and talent all combined together, I don't think we can ask for anything more, especially when we, majority of, especially in your area and across all of Northern Alberta, we have such vast remote areas. In Northern Alberta, there's some places that it's three hours one way for ground access, you know, ground ambulance access. It may be a 40 minute flight for us and we're bringing that intensive care unit environment. It's, it really is a winning combination, but we can't do it without partners like you. So uh, that's wonderful. And so my next question is, I noticed you heard, uh, you said Alberta and you said Saskatchewan funding. Have you, do you guys get funding from BC? 
province? No. We, we have tried over the years, we tried to work with the BC government in order, and even you know looked at the possibility of maybe like a STARS light base or something. It's been, and then government would change. And then we would get some traction again, and then government would change. And so, no, we have not. And now with the expansion, in 2011, um, Manitoba was having the flood situation, and they asked us to come help them for a week uh, taking one helicopter on a contract to help them with the flood situation. The following year, the exact same thing happened to them and they called us again and said, we'll, uh, we'll pay on a contract, we need your help for this one week, but they said, this time, we don't want you to leave. We will figure it out and you tell us what we need because we want this kind of service for our residents. And so that's what ended up happening. We started out in Man Manitoba with 100% government funding. Now they're, they're trying to scale back and eventually evolve to like a, um, a half and half model, which is what is happening in Saskatchewan. The very next year, 2012, Saskatchewan said, hey, wait a minute, we're right here in the middle of the two of you, we want stars too. So they came to the table with a 50% fundraising, 50% government funding, and so hopefully Manitoba will eventually evolve to that model and hopefully in Alberta we will evolve to a 50-50 as well, which would just make it much more attainable on an annual basis to continue, you know, because the, the mission rate is not going down. Okay. Questions? Anyone? I uh, have one about uh, the border logistics that we talked about uh, with uh, Alberta and BC. I think that has to do with some of the, why the money doesn't want to be poured in from our province, but yet we see the value in the stars in the Peace River Regional District, right? Yeah. That one included there, because we, we live on industry. We've always been uh, industry-based in, in the area, yeah. and we're looking to diversify. Then you have tourism, because we have a beautiful uh, country that we live in here. Uh, right, it extends right into Alberta, but uh, yep, yeah, and that, that's one of the big things that uh, the Peace River Regional uh, kind of was asking of BC, but BC says no, same, to, same as they said to you, right? Just stars that, you know, it, yeah. it would take a little bit more than just us asking. So yeah, the, that is a big factor on the, uh, the four year cycle, right? Okay. Uh, the voting cycle that we, we live in. Yes, um, currently, um you know, we will continue to work from the district side of things. So I'm going to continue to try and work way down on the eastern side of BC and work with more of the districts because we do serve largely your entire area from the Grand Prairie base. And we also serve the, south, the southernmost eastern BC districts from the Calgary base. But going forward though, I know there's been significant um, collaboration together now that we're able to work very closely with your directors and your lead physicians out of the Kamloops Dispatch Center. Like that really moved things forward. We, we have quarterly meetings. I have quarterly meetings to go over Q&A for, you know, to make sure that there is quality assurance on each call. So there, there are um, plans in place that, you know, are taking place, which has really advanced our opportunity to serve your residents. And, and we're, the statistics are, are showing that as well. It's reflected in the statistics. Yeah, one uh, genius thing that I've seen here was that uh, having the doctor answer the calls and uh, giving that back to the, the critical nurse on, on, the, mm -hmm. on the helicopter, right, coming in. So how, how, whose idea was that? Somebody came up with that idea that uh, bring, bring him in and have him or her answer the phone or send somebody out there and, and talk to them on the way back on what needs to be done when you get here, we're, we're already on it. That thing, that place there is just like getting the CEO to go pile boards or, <laughs> or dig, dig a hole, right? This is what we do on the ground. So you know, that, that was pretty uh, ingenious. Sure. Well, we've always, um, we've always had contact with our transport physicians through radio contact, mm -hmm. you know, on the previous helicopter. Now with all the uh, advancements in um, communications, 
being able to do that and the fact that we had COVID. So now we weren't able to go out, which meant that we needed to be able to find other ways to bring critical care to our rural communities, especially in the other 90% of the calls that come in where the helicopter may not attend. So this is where we're still able to share critical care knowledge and guidance, you know, because we, we see this every day. The rural communities, their doctors as nurses do not see that every day. So this is just another enhancement where we can work together and assist. And now, you know, they can FaceTime each other. And that was maybe uh, one of the positive things that came out of COVID. I like to think of it that it, it was, you know, a positive. If anybody has got anything else, we'd like to thank you for that and uh, continue to save lives. Thank you very much for your time and we appreciate your support on October 13th. Thank you. Okay. We have, we have, yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. The remainder of the calendar, the brand new calendar is out again. So I did bring that for you. And this is the latest story. It's a very compelling story, uh, very near and dear to our hearts because it is uh, one of our own. She's uh, um, one of our STARS pilots that actually helped us start the Grand Prairie base. They've moved to Calgary now, but he's still a STARS pilot that his wife was working for Fish and Wildlife and was attacked by a cougar while she was. So there, and just in closing, I don't want to forget this. We're very proud that you have been standing by our side for over 15 years. And we just want to offer a small token of appreciation to the District of Chetland for your ongoing support and that we hope that you'll be proud to hang it somewhere that your residents will know that you are ensuring they have access to stars and to a robust health and safety network. Do you mind if we grab a picture here? Yes, yeah. please. Thank you. Bylaws B1, District of Chetland Fire Protection and Life Safety Regulations Bylaw number 1151 2022 requires first, second, and third reading. On motion, uh, first, second, and third reading. Second. Discussion. I wouldn't mind some more time. And, um, we have to vote first anyway, don't we? Go 
Go ahead. Go ahead, staff. Council could make a motion to table table the motion. So if we table the motion, when would we be talking about this? Like, would we be able to do this before the new council? Or should I voice all my concerns right now and then you'll have them or, or what? Because I mean, we only have, this council has a month, so. We do have another council meeting October 17th yeah. that you could uh, discuss them at that point. But if you want, if, if all of council wanted to either right now or email questions that they have, then we could make sure to have all those answers for you. I'm good with either way, um, but I think it's something that we should, this, this council should talk about before we throw this onto the new council. I don't think it'd be fair to them to be thrown into something like this. So that's, I, I'm good with either one. Like we, I think all the councillors need a little bit more time to absorb this. And then on the 17th, we can discuss all my concerns about it. Yeah, it's the wish of the council. If uh, that's the wish of tabling, let's uh, have a motion to that effect, or let's continue to discuss. Uh, we still have a motion that we'd have to defeat, right? Staff? We can table it and then consider it at the next meeting. Are we able to quickly hear Laura's concerns tonight and still table it though? Sure. Absolutely. You might as well. If you wish, Councillor. Hmm? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, <laughs> All right, can you hear me now? Yeah. All right, so I, I guess my biggest concerns um, on, on this is that I, I think it's not something that we want to put in place. I, I, first of all, I think it gives one person, and that's a chief, way too much control over all the decisions that are being made on here. I realize that right now, when the voting of, voting of new members comes into play, I know the way they used to do it, the officers would sit with the chief and they would talk about it and decide if that's the person they want on their fire department. While that's taken completely out of their control, the chief is the one that's making all the decisions on that, which I totally didn't disagree with. Um, the other ones, as soon as I find them here. I can't, I'm sorry, it's on page, I don't know, it's on section, it's in section eight. Appointment and accountability of officers and members. So, like the first one, all members of the fire department shall be appointed by the fire chief. Officers shall appoint by the fire chief as vacancies occurs and as needed from firefighters meeting the qualified standards, which or what? I don't know. Officers are accountable to the fire chief or the deputy fire chief for the actions and affairs of the members under their command, like accountable to what extent? These are all volunteers. Um, members are account. Oh, I read that one already. Sorry. Um, so that's m my main part of this. Um, is and next one is the um, number ten. Says that uh, the very bottom line there, the protection and or rescue boundaries of the district shall without consent of the. Chief Administration Officer, I thought that used to include the Mayor, and I think it should include the Mayor. I don't think it should just be the Chief Administration Officer or express authority of a written agreement between the district and other entities. I think the Mayor needs to be included in that conversation, or he can appoint a Councillor to be included in that conversation, whatever. Um, so that, that, that's my main concern. Um, there's, a, there's other ones in this um, document. If you want me to continue going? Yep. Uh, okay. Continue. So the next one is commandeering of privately owned equipment, which is under section two, number seven. The fire chief or the office of command at any incident is hereby empowered to command privately owned equipment. 
which he is, she is considered necessary to deal with the intent. I, I don't get how we can just take someone's private equipment. I, I guess I don't get that. Um, so that I have a question for that. I'm sorry, it's section two, part two, sorry, yeah, part two. I was going section, is our, we got part two. Yeah, yeah. Um, number seven. It's, I, I'm sorry, they don't have page numbers on. Oh, where, there it is, page eight of 29. You see the page numbers on there? Okay. So that's my other question. I don't know how we can just take someone's piece of equipment and, and use it. Um, so I'm just ask a question about um, Councillor Weisgerber's uh, points here. Um, are they are these points that she's bringing up um, different than what's on the original bylaw? Yes. The bylaw that this bylaw is replacing. The one All of those points are. Yes, the ones that we're repealing. You mean the bylaw that mm -hmm. we're going to repeal? Yes. I don't see the anywhere in here that everything is left up to the fire chief. Like that on that part. So in the previous bylaw, or the bylaw that this bylaw is replacing, what is at stake? Um, how has it changed and why? Well, it used to be that the council used to appoint the fire, fire, fire departments. Um, where is it here? Unless I'm missing something, Carol, am I missing something? I don't, I've read through this and I don't anywhere see in that. Go ahead, staff. Oh, so in part two of, I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. In part two of the um, bylaw 468, it talks about administration and operation. So the fire chief is appointed by resolution of council, that's the same as now. Um, other officers and members of the department are appointed by council as recommended by the fire chief. So there is, um, the fire chief would still be the one who's recommending the officers and then it would still be subject to council ratification. Um, but the fire chief would still be ultimately accountable. And, and that's why we hire a fire chief is to run the, the fire department. So this, this bylaw, sorry, um, the new bylaw, it's um, up-to-date legislation and it's been passed through our legal counsel and they've made several changes and it's in line in alignment with the current fire code and, and other bylaws like it, other communities have bylaws similar to it. So it's not, it's not um, edgy, you know, it's not something new, but it's something that a lot of other municipalities are using as well. Continue. Oh, sure. and, and I get that, and, and that's good. I, I understand that. Am I on? Yep. That, am I on now? Carol, you might want to shut yours off. Oh, okay. no, I think. Can you hear me now? Yeah, I, I like that, and I get it. And I'm not throwing the fire chief under the bus. It's just that when we look at our next fire chief, what happens to that fire chief only wants to pick his buddies? Like, I, I really think that there has to be more people making a decision instead of just the fire chief on the firemen. I mean, it's hard enough getting volunteers. I, I think, go ahead. Sorry. Um, yeah, so that, that's a kind of a, a policy decision. How, I mean, council makes the policies and then staff carry them out. So that's kind of routinely done. Um, but I just wanted to also mention that the, the prior Fire bylaw does also in section 2.22, it also enables the fire chief to commandeer private equipment. You see that? 
Yeah. And so I'm looking on page six of the previous bylaw, 468, 2.22. The fire chief or member in charge of an incident is empowered to commandeer privately owned equipment which he considers necessary to deal with an incident. I can't hear anything that's being said. Sorry, can you hear me now, Janet? Yes. Okay, sorry. So, I, so I, I was just saying, I, I agree, but just because other bylaws or other communities are doing doesn't mean we need to follow suit. Um, so, um, do I mean, okay, I'm gonna keep continuing here. So the inspections under the Fire Services Act, which is on page 10 of 29, are, are we doing these fire inspections? Like I know it's been a while and I know with COVID, it was kind of a hit and miss there. Are, are we doing inspections now? Yes. Councillor, can you just a button? If we're, if we're dealing with the, the policy and then we're asking questions about what uh, the, uh, his, he's doing, uh, are we causing we we're asking a question about what he's Is doing somebody now. speaking? Yep. Yep, I am, Jen. Good. I can hear you now. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we are, are we asking about uh, his what he's doing, or are we asking about the policy? I'm asking about the policy. Yeah, I'm okay. Sorry, I'm asking about the policy. I just first part of my question. Okay. So in here it says it used to be and that council will receive a report. We haven't received a report in a long time. So that's why I'm wondering if we're gonna get a report. So, kind of two questions there. Yeah. Well, we could skip that section, that's fine. Yeah. Can I make a suggestion just, just I mean, it definitely um, has to do with this issue, but it's um, kind of, uh, uh, what I'm thinking is, and, and, and this is for any change in bylaw, when we have a change in bylaw, is it possible to um, have the previous and the, the new bylaws, uh, the part that's being changed, if we can have both of those in front of us, uh, I think it would be a huge time saver. Okay. Yeah. Normally, if it's um, if it's a digital version, we try to do a track changes for council. But in this case, this file uh, was from the '80s, and it, I think it was hand typed, so we weren't able to do that. Um, I could definitely have emailed it to you, though. I, I, Lenora has distributed it tonight, but I could have emailed it. So definitely, we can do that. Okay, yeah, once uh, we decide here if it's table, then we'll uh, receive that part, the old uh, policy, or old bylaw. Okay, so that I, th I think I'm going to end there. Um, I think I, everyone should take it home, take a little, just from what I said, take a look at what you guys think. I might be totally out to lunch here, I don't know, but I really don't think I am. So that's just what I think we need to talk about next meeting. Can I, can I say something? Go ahead, Janet. Uh, I, you know, there's definitely uh, a lot of value in what Councillor Weisgerber is saying. Um, and, you know, that's because uh, of her personal situation. She, she's aware of, uh, of a lot that the average resident isn't aware of. So again, if we had um, the previous bylaw side by side with the new bylaw, we can actually see the changes and uh, it, it would make it a lot more clear. Thanks. Yep, the statement of uh, being with, uh, with the department and knowing the person there sometimes is kind of, you're just about involved. And here we are council, 
we counsel the whole of Chapman. We don't just counsel one one household. So, you know, that statement, we, we've got to be careful in what we do as counsel. We got to do it for Chapman. We got to make sure that it's done properly. So that's why we have the old uh, bylaw and the new one and making sure that we're not doing what we, uh, we're doing the proper thing for Chapman. Are we uh, tailing? Is there a motion now? Or should we? I make a motion to table. I'll again, that motion to table. again, again. I will make that motion to table it to the seven, October 17th meeting. Second. All those in favor? Opposed? Carried. Committee reports. Okay, uh, Mayor, we'll uh, start. Uh, I'll uh, start with uh, UBCM. <clears throat> we uh, were in Whistler and uh, met with with our Minister of Municipal Affairs, Minister Cullen, and we discussed our satellite uh, taxation uh, issue that we have with uh, our uh, limited uh, uh, taxation that we can uh, tax them. So we had a really good discussion with him and uh, the staff. So it was uh, the staff that we really put our point across and they were very, very accepting of our uh, position. And usually it's the staff that give the direction to the minister. So we're very hopeful that we might get move, movement this year on that uh, matter of the satellite taxes. So it's very hopeful. And uh, that, that was one of the highlights. And uh, one of the other uh, lights was uh, Northern Health, our meeting with Northern Health. My uh, take and uh, from my personal experience with uh, Northern Health, I uh, expressed my concerns about the administration beyond Chapman. Uh, the administration here in Chapman with Northern Health acceptable on my account was uh, outside administration of what uh, Northern Health showed me. So this was expressed and it was taken uh, from the chair and from uh, the Northern Health, uh, the chair of the board of Northern Health and Northern Health itself uh, taking uh, notes saying that, so you must hear and I said, yes, I hear from the people that are, uh, that are the foot uh, soldiers of our uh, community, the nurses that uh, are here in Chapman. And I've seen uh, what uh, happened in the, with the administration that we had meetings with Northern Health. So that was my concern and uh, it was duly noted and taken down. So that was uh, one of the things that we dealt with in uh, Whistler. Uh, the other was, uh, I'd like to uh, con congratulate uh, Janet Wark for LGLA Leadership Award. And I'd like to just take a minute and thank you, Janet, for, for us. And uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was kind of a surprise. So we were, in, we were in our caucus meeting in the north and taking pictures. And it was uh, totally awesome. It was uh, one of the better feelings of uh, being someplace at a conference, running back and forth between places. So it was very rewarding that we had uh, somebody getting an award from Chatwin and, and uh, thank you, Janet, for that. And uh, we, had, uh, we had some uh, speakers because it's, uh, uh, I know elections for the province are a little ways away, but uh, it was felt like it was election going on there in, in Whistler. Uh, uh, the leader of the opposition, he spoke, uh, Kevin Falcon, and he was here in Chatwin just uh, a month ago, and he uh, spoke very well of, uh, of our community, of the carvings, and uh, the community itself, and uh, so they, uh, he was very pleased with the Chamber of Commerce here in Chatwin and uh, in Tumbler Ridge and in the area. So he spoke very highly of that uh, after, the, after his uh, address of the UPCM uh, delegates. So it was very, very nice of that uh, 
uh, that fellow to uh, mention that Chapman was uh, part of the part of the highlights of uh, this year that he brought seven other ministers with him when he did attend Chapman. So it was very nice. And they went, they did go to Carver's Row. I think half of them were there, or most of them were there taking pictures. So uh, very nice one. So the other part was uh, Premier Horgan and uh, Minister Dix. Minister Dix talked about the health healthcare system, and it's always uh, nice and pretty when he talks about the numbers and we did this and we did that. And uh, yet we've got a, a opioid crisis and uh, we've got a housing crisis. And it seemed like the crisis has just went on and on. So, you know, there's more work to be done than just a happy face on, a, on a, an emoji sign telling us that we're all right. We are not all right in the opioid crisis. Uh, if you walk down uh, uh, Hastings in Vancouver, the housing situation. So we, we are in a little bit of a situation, situation where we are uh, in... Uh, I wouldn't say we were poor in what we do, but uh, when you look at it, it seems that way in what we do in our uh, province. So anyway, uh, to the pre Premier, and uh, I, I met him outside the conference centre and asked him about his health, and that's all I did. Ask him about his health, and he said he was fine, so that's all I have. Uh, have. And uh, we talked about uh, other things, uh, about where we were going with the, our uh, situation with the housing. So he had some ideas and so does the federal government. Uh, the federal government had some uh, ideas on putting money into it, but uh, just like everything else, a shortage in, uh, in professionals. So he spoke, uh, he does speak very well, the Premier. Uh, he's always had excellent speeches, so he's very uh, good at that. So anyway, that was a, that was a goodbye speech and uh, so, uh, that was that. It was it was different. Whistler, you got to walk and you got to, got to walk all over. You didn't have to get on a bus or grab a taxi, so it was very convenient. One of the things uh, I think it was uh, a few years back, Whistler put in a resolution about carbon tax. We took a bus there. We took a plane there. You know, so you know it was kind of like uh, ironic that we have to take so long to get there and you know, all the carbon that we used up. So, yeah, so that was one of the things that I talked with, with uh, the minister uh, about, is that if we're going to do one thing, we can't be saying another. So anyway, it was uh, very, very uh, rewarding that we got to talk to uh, uh, Minister Colin. And Janet getting an award was, <laughs> was the bonus. Thanks. <laughs> okay, any other reports? Janet? Janet? I have a report. Yeah, thanks. So, as the mayor said, we attended uh, UBCM in Whistler, September 12th, 16. And the session I would like to report on is a learning from the Linton Fire, preventing future wild, wildlife disasters. Uh, there was much information shared, such as uh, local ignition conditions of a structure and its immediate surroundings within 30 meters principally determine structure ignition during extreme wildfires. So they say that we can control these residential fields. Uh, burning structures and adjacent vegetation are significant sources of burning embers that continue community fire spread hours after significant wildfire exposure, exposures have ceased. Um, so the wild wildland urban fire is a structure ignition problem, not a wildfire control problem. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is everybody needs to be familiar with Fire Smart BC and they need to follow all of the recommendations and I know that Chetwin has been doing a great job sharing that with uh, parts of the community and so just uh, some points to to take care of uh, going forward are the following assess the roof install a spark arrestor on the chimney keep gutters clean assess eaves and vents, use fire resistant siding, install fire resistant windows, ensure doors and fire rated 
are, are fire rated and have a proper seal, clean under deck, uh, and, and of course the outbuildings, don't forget the outbuildings, the list goes on, so please everyone familiarize yourself with firesmart.ca and the homeowner's manual um, on there to reduce the potential impacts of wildfire on your home. And that is my report. Any questions? I need a motion to accept the reports. I've got one more. You have one report? Okay, one more report, Councillor Weisman. And Councillor, okay, gotcha. So my report is, is gonna be short. Um, I'm really happy to say we have the funding and the seniors are getting a new kitchen. It's been a long time coming. I've been working on this file for probably two and a half to three years. And I am so happy that we finally got the last little bit of the funding and it's moving forward. I actually meet with the contractor tomorrow and the building inspector, and then I'll be doing my happy dance. <laughs> okay, thank you, uh, Councillor Deck. Yeah, the um, Checkland uh, Communication Society has uh, dispersed money from the um, Checkland TV bingos, uh, and there's been several. Um, recipients throughout the community. Also, uh, just a, a thank you plaque from the uh, Canadian Cancer Society from the Tour of the Tour de North. They send it to the District of Chetwin, so they can put it up here. Thank you very much. That's it. Okay. Is there a public notice for uh, where, where the uh, contributes from the bingo? If I'd, written them, if, if I'd written them all down, there would be, but Marlon would know where they are. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Uh, we'll get that information and uh, we'll put it on our web uh, page uh, once uh, we receive it. So thank you very much, uh, Councillor. Okay, now an option. All those in favor? Carried. Discussion item, email from BC Natural Resource Forum dated September 21st, 2022. Registration opens for the 20th annual BC Natural Resources Forum. I'll make that recommendation that all council, all members of council be authorized to attend the 2023 BC Natural Resources Forum in Prince George, BC, January 17th to 19th, 2023. Did you uh, get that, Janet? Nope, they didn't. You're gonna have to repeat. Go ahead. Can you hear me now? And I'm assuming Councillor Depp did the motion. Yeah. Yes. Yes, I did. Yeah. You want me to read it again? <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. No, it might also have something to do with my connection. So, okay. thank you. And seconded by Councillor Bazandowski. I have a comment on this conference. Out of all the conferences that I've ever went to on council, this is probably by far one of the best conferences I have went to. So I highly recommend that the new council attend this and our current council attend this. It's a great conference. Thank you, uh, Councillor Weisberg. Correspondence. Oh, we did that, okay. The information no, item. Oh, okay. Sorry about that. Okay, all those in favor? All those opposed? Carry. Information items. I want to I-22. Your worship? I think we've got um, C1. Correspond. Oh, okay. I'll I make a motion right to receive uh, C1. Second. Okay, we're, we've got the motion to make C1. Uh, 
We got the motion to make uh, letter C1, letter from the BC Emergency Health Service dated uh, September 14, 2022, uh, re-expanding emergency health service in your community. And do you say, Councillor Deck, second? Discussion? All those in favor? Carried. Okay, down to information items. Motion to receive I-1 to I-22. Second. All those in favor? Okay. Reports to action, RA-1, ratification of the email poll resolution, award of architect service for new fire hall. I'll make the recommendation that Council ratify the resolution adopted by email poll on September 23rd, 2022 to approve the architectural firm of Johnson Davidson Architecture to provide designs of the new fire hall for Council's approval for the amount of $61,644, excluding GST. Second. Discussion? I have a question. Um, uh, if when when we get this report is this report going to be is do we need this report to apply for grants yes we do um because we can't apply for grants unless we have um a firm product that we can we can say this is what sorry this is what we need the money for so we do need that mm -hmm. so do we have to say yay or nay on this project before we can apply for grants yeah. So then after this report comes to us is when the new council will make a decision if we're going to build a fire hall and then we're going to go forward with grant yeah. opportunities. So, yeah, and we'll also have to decide where the funding is coming from. We would, would obviously um, really go after as many grants as we can and then we'd also have to come up with a funding model, possibly borrowing or, or however council decides that they want to move forward with it. So one more question, sorry. Yeah. So what, what is this report going to tell us? It's going to tell us how much it's going to cost mm -hmm. to do this. It's going to tell us what the building's going to look like. Mm -hmm. like yeah. yeah, so they will offer options for uh, what their building could look like, and then council can will have feedback on what they want the building to look like. So you can make changes, the council can make changes, and um, then they'll move forward with a, a product that council is in favor of. And the most important, well, that's really important, and the other really important thing is to give you an idea of what it will cost. And then you can, like, just like with this building, I don't know if you remember, but you were offered an idea of what it would look like, conceptual drawings, and then council made the decision to pare it down a little bit, you know, to, keep the, to control the costs a bit more. So you can do that as well. Or expand it, of course. Any more discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. RA2, 2023 Business Facade Improvement Program Grant. Bless you. I'll make that recommendation that council approve the application to Northern. Yeah, okay, is that better? I'll make the recommendation that Council approve the application to Northern Develop Development Initiative Trust for the Facade Improvement Program for 2023. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Carry. RA3, ratification of email poll. Oh. Which one are we on here? Yeah. Conflict, conflict of interest, uh, Councillor Deck moved himself. Okay, ratification of email poll resolution award of Lagoon Road construction tender. 
I'll make the recommendation that council ratify the resolution adopted by email poll on September 15, 2022 to approve the Lagoon Road construction project be awarded to Pine River Holdings Limited for the amount of $95,691.75 excluding GST. Councilor Weisgur seconds. Any discussion? All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. RA4, request for co quotations, Chetwin Street Lights. Yeah. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I, I rec I'll make that recommendation that Council will award the 2022 RFQ Chetwin Street Lights project to CDM2 Lightworks at a quota price of $160,018.50, excluding GST. Discussion? I have a question. Sorry, I have a question. Try it again. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Um, and maybe you said it. Where, where is this? Where is this going? Like, where is these three lights going? May yeah. I ask yeah. Desiree yeah. to reply to that? Uh, yeah, it's for the downtown, part of the downtown revitalization plan. So they'll be going along 51st Street that goes up past the pharmacy and 50th Ave that goes between the two grocery stores and 49th Ave, which is the liquor store. Oh, yeah. awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Any more discussion? Oh, Will we be able to hang Christmas decorations from these things? Yes. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> All those in favor? Any opposed? Carry. RA5, Permissive Tax Exemption Bylaw. I'll make that recommendation that the District of Chetwin Tax Exemption Bylaw number 1152-2022 be introduced and given first, second, and third readings. Second. Discussion? I have questions. Um, have we have we done this before for <coughs> the flying club? For the flying flying club, no. This is they put in the request this year. We didn't have a, that second meeting in September where I would have brought it forward for discussion. So I've put it on to let you guys discuss it now and decide whether or not you want to keep it included. So what kind of dollar value are we looking at here? Municipal dollar value around four hundred dollars. Total is around eight hundred and seventy, I believe. Oh, okay. Any I have a discussion? question. Yep, go ahead. Go ahead, Councillor. Work. Um, so Kevin, we haven't for a flying club. So, um, you know, when I look at our bylaw and, and see who has tax exemptions, in my mind, a flying club doesn't fall under um, any of the any of the category for what we've exe made exemptions for. I don't know about anybody else, but um, I don't really feel that this warrants an exemption. And this is a privately owned um, organization and I'm not really sure how we can justify uh, giving them an exemption um, as a flying club. Go ahead, Councillor. And I agree with you, Janet. I, I do because I, I kind of was thinking that too. I don't know how 
how we can. Is there some other way that we can help them? I mean, 400 or 800 isn't a lot of money, but but still, they're a club that um, there's lots of clubs out there that probably could use a tax break. But I'm just wondering, is there something else that we could do for them? The only the only other thing I think you could do for them that would be easy would be to waive their annual lease fee on the, the hangar, which I'm not sure. I'm going to guess at around $120 a year, something like that. Any more discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Those opposed? I'm opposed. I'm opposed. Okay, so it's, it's defeated then. Okay. Uh, go ahead, uh, Kevin. Your Worship, if I may, um, if the the sole reason for the defeat is the flying club issue. If uh, we could get this bylaw read for second and third time as amended, removing that section, this is a bylaw that we have to have completed before the end of October for any of these to take effect for next year. So, so you're saying you need a motion to accept all but the flying clubs is what you're looking for yes with the we, we need to to have this bylaw adopted before the end of this month or none of these can take effect for next year so if the objection is the flying club if you could read it without the flying club in there as amended all right i can make that motion um As I find what I'm reading here again. Sorry. I'll make that recommendation that the District of Chetwin Tax Exemption Bylaw Number 1152 2022 be introduced and given first, second, and third readings with the exception of the Flying Club. That's uh, good enough. Okay. Second. Okay, Councillor Deck, second. Any discussion? Not hearing any. All those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. <clears throat> Reports or information are a one. Oh, oh, yeah, I forgot. We have. Uh, Mel, you are, yeah. uh, Councillor Deck, you have already uh, yeah. given your report on the, are you going to do a report on this? Because we've already, already did. Okay, so we only got one. Okay, Councillor Deck has excused himself for conflict. Engineer from engineer and public from engineer and public from engineers and public works. We have Wabi Crescent uh, Southeast Sanitary Upgrade Sidewalk Addition. I'll make the recommendation that council approve a change order of two hundred and ninety thousand dollars, excluding GST, to the Wabi Crescent Southeast Sanitary Upgrades contract for the construction of a new concrete sidewalk and curb and gutter along Wabi Crescent Southeast. Okay, Councillor uh, Wesner of Seconds, uh, just a little information, uh, staff? I was gonna ask Desiree to speak to that. Okay. Um, is this, can you, okay. Um, well, we had originally budgeted for a full depth road reconstruction along Wabi Crescent, um, but when we looked at the road structure, 
Uh, we feel it can be reused, um, and so there was significant cost savings on the overall contract value. Uh, and so if we add a sidewalk uh, from um, the south side, southwest side of the bridge, the Lobby Crescent Bridge, all the way over to Nicholson, um, we can do that all still within the original budgeted amount. Thank you very much. Any, any other, uh, any discussion, any more? Yeah. Um, I think that's a great idea. I, I love the concept of the sidewalks. I think sidewalks are much a much needed part of Chetland. And I know we talked about doing sidewalks in other locations and it's extremely expensive. So kudos to you yep. for saving that money and putting it towards this, it's great. Any more discussion? I, I'd just like to echo that too. Anytime we can squeeze it into the budget, even if it's a little bit extra, I think it's well worth it too. Any more? Okay, all those in favor? Any opposed? Carried. And Councillor Deck had. Uh, Thank you for supporting the Canadian Cancer Society Cops for Cancer 2022 Tour de North. So we'll, we'll put our plaque up. Thank you very much, Mel. Okay, with that, any public questions? Okay. I thought I was going home. Okay, uh, re reports for information, uh, August account payable checks list. I'll make that recommendation. The check register in the month of August 2022 totaling 1616735 be received. I have a question on, on it. Yes, I can. Well, you guys will be glad that I'm not here anymore. Right? No, no, we won't. Your meetings will just go like that. Um, I, I one of them I've lost it. Oh, so there's a check that we wrote to DNS Electric for fifty-two thousand dollars. I'm just curious of what that would be for. Sorry, that will be the electrical work being done in front of the uh, rec center along that pathway. Any other questions or discussion? Not seeing any. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Your Worship, I think we had one more item about air quality. Yeah. Okay, uh, one more. So Janet, go ahead, the uh, floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, I would just like to bring this possibly to the next. Uh, I, I guess what I'm asking for is to revisit this and uh, to bring back the information we received the last time in regards to this issue. And I would like to know if we have an, uh, if um, the, uh, the gas plant is using an active monitor or a passive monitor. Councillor Work, is that a question or is that uh, uh, just a general statement of yeah. we're, we're going to find out or you know? Yeah, I mean, if, if the answer, if somebody has a yeah. they great. If not, we can find that out next week. But I would like to read the monitor for the citizens of Chatwin. So, so we can do some research on that and bring that back. Did you copy that, uh, Janet? She's great. Gonna... Okay, Thank go ahead, you. Carol. Yeah, Carol's going to get some information 
on that on the live or not and uh, on the monitor again I think we've uh, had a cost given to us in the past and uh, we will uh, uh, Carol uh, CAO will uh, look look it up again okay perfect thank okay. you thank you any more stuff oh. <laughs> okay any pu any public on the line Okay. Number of them. Okay. Adjournment. Yeah. Second.